Welcome to uh, From the Woods today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm an information specialist with the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And if you've seen our show before, I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas. I always appreciate him uh, joining us and helping me out with this show today. Well, thanks Renee. Um, as you said, I'm Billy Thomas, an extension forester in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension and um, we're delighted to be with you all today. Um, I would like to acknowledge that just last week has been especially difficult for Kentuckians um, and our nation um, with a lot of stuff that's going on on top of the pandemic and um, you know there's a lot of people that are hurting right now. Um, but what we're trying to do with this show is bring everybody together uh, around the environment, the natural resources and our forest here in Kentucky. So um, we've got a good show lined up for you all today and we're going to press on with that. Um, Renee, we're going to be talking all about White Oak today. Definitely, white oak all the time. And um, I did find out from Lori Thomas that uh, June is the great outdoors month. So um, what better way for our show is because most of it is all outdoors. So that works out really well for us. But white oak is our main topic for today. And so um, like, let's get started on that. Right. So yeah, Laurie's going to be doing our tree of the week, which is white oak. Um, and then we're also going to have um, Dr. Ellen Crocker going to be talking about a citizen science opportunity. Um, and then we'll have Darren Morris, who is an extension forester in our department as well, and also the coordinator of the white oak initiative. It's a new effort that's going on to try to address long term sustainability of white oak. Um, and then if we have time, we've got a short video on some efforts of the Jim Beam Institute with the University of Kentucky on how some of the folks in the um, distillery industry have a responded to the COVID pandemic. Um, so um, we hope you all have a lot of great questions for us. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with Laurie's video right now on the tree of the week. Hi, I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And I'm here with the tree of the week, the white oak, Quercus alba, an outstanding tree among all trees. It's the most important lumber tree of the white oak group. It's a large tree typically growing 80 to 100 feet tall and on really good sites it may grow over 100 feet tall with a diameter greater than 5 feet. White oak is slow growing and long lived living up to 400 to 500 years. White oak is native to the eastern and midwestern United States. It grows in many sites and soil types but grows best in deep moist well drained soils of coves and higher bottom lands. In the southern Appalachians it exhibits best growth on north facing slopes and in coves. White oak is generally classed as intermediate in shade tolerance. It's most tolerant in youth and becomes less tolerant as the tree becomes larger. White oak flowers are monoecious, meaning one house, which means a tree will have both male and female flowers. The male flowers are yellow-green, born in a drooping slender catkin that's about two to four inches long. The female flowers are reddish-green and appear as very small, single spikes. The flowers emerge with the leaves in mid-spring. The leaves of the white oak are deciduous and are rose-colored when they unfurl in the early spring, and they mature into a darker green. They are alternately arranged on the twig, as you can see in the photo here, and simple. They're made up of only one blade. They are typically four to seven inches long with seven to ten rounded lobes. You can tell white oak leaves from red oak leaves by the lobes. The lobes of the white oak leaf, as you can see in the top photo here, are rounded, and the lobes of the red oaks, as you can see in the bottom of the photo here, have a bristle tip on them. The fall color is usually attractive, ranging from a rich red to a reddish brown. The fruit of the white oak is an oblong acorn with a warty, bowl-shaped cap. The cap detaches at maturity. As the acorn matures, it changes color from green to brown. Acorns mature in one growing season and germinate almost immediately after falling to the ground in September to October. White oak can produce seed prolifically, but good acorn crops are irregular and occur only every four to ten years. Trees normally bear seeds between the ages of 50 and 200 years. Wind and gravity aid in the dispersal of acorns. Wildlife are also responsible for acorn dispersal, including blue jays and gray squirrel. Both are effective in dis dispersing the seed a distance from the parent tree. Acorns are an important wildlife food and are consumed by more than a hundred different vertebrates, including birds such as wild turkey, blue jays, northern bobwhite, the wood duck, and ruffed grouse. Mammals that eat the acorns include red squirrel, rabbits, and black bear. In some areas, black bear reproductive success is affected by the success or failure of the acorn crop. 
we know that from the tiny acorn, a mighty oak tree grows. And according to the National Wildlife Federation, oaks are one of the top 10 trees for wildlife because they help wildlife grow. Oaks serve as a host tree for more than 500 different Lepidopteran larvae, including dagger moths and the giant silk moth that you see here in this photo. These larvae in turn feed seasonal migratory songbirds, such as our warblers. These large trees also provide critical nesting habitat for many of our cavity nesters, including the white-breasted nuthatch. The white oak also provides good cover for a variety of mammals as well, because the leaves typically persist longer than other plant associates in the forest. The bark is light ashy gray and can be very variable in appearance. On small to medium-sized trees, it's often broken up into small aligned blocks, which are scaly on the surface. As the tree matures, the bark is irregularly plated and fissured. The heartwood of white oak is typically a light to medium brown, and the sapwood is light brown. The grain is straight with a coarse, uneven texture. Oaks are ring porous with rows of large pores, as you can see in the photo here. In white oak, these pores are filled with tyloses, which makes this wood desirable for use in making barrels that contain liquid because it will not leak out. However, the pores in red oaks are open, which is a good characteristic to help you identify red oak wood from white oak wood. White oak is commercially a very important wood. The wood is used for furniture, cabinetry, veneer, paneling and flooring. You probably have some type of white oak product in your own home. White oak wood is also integral in the bourbon industry. For bourbon to be considered bourbon, it must be aged in charred new oak barrels made from white oak. Kentucky is considered the birthplace for bourbon, crafting 95% of the world's supply. In last year, 1.7 million barrels were filled with bourbon for a total of 7.5 million barrels, the highest inventory in more than 40 years. The national champion white oak is in Brunswick, Virginia. It's 331 inches in circumference, 90 feet tall with a 120 foot crown spread. It'd be a nice tree to have in your front yard. In Kentucky, we have co-champion white oaks. One's in Warren County. It's 228 inches in diameter, 112 feet tall, with a 119 foot crown spread. The other co-champion is in Greene County. It's 256 inches in circumference, 82 feet tall, and 117 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree National Register or the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about white oak. The white oak is the state tree of Connecticut, Illinois, and Maryland. Connecticut State Quarter was minted with a picture and inscription of a famous white oak tree, the Charter Oak. Maryland's Y Oak was long recognized as the largest white oak tree in the nation. It was estimated to be more than 500 years old when it came down in a storm in 2002. The scientific name for white oak is Quercus alba. Quercus is the Latin name for the oak tree, and alba is Latin for white, referring to the light-colored bark. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the mighty white oak and have a chance to get out into your neighborhood, a local park, or your woodland and appreciate the wonders of the white oak. Well, that was a great introduction on white oak for what we're going to be seeing later on today in the show and uh, pre really appreciate Lori Thomas doing that for us and trying to get us acclimated with all things about white oak. You know, one thing that's interesting thing that popped out of that was she said there was basically more barrels of bourbon than there are people in Kentucky. Um, exactly. <laughs> that, that was a surprising uh, a statistic to me. Yeah, thanks, Laurie, for a great video there. So, um, all right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit now. We're going to have uh, Dr. Ellen Crocker come on with us. Hi, Ellen. Um, Ellen, as you know, is our forest health specialist. She's the extension professor here in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and she's a huge contributor to this show, not only with content, um, but with lots of great ideals and helping us interface with um, county extension agents as well. So, Ellen, great to have you on talking about citizen science opportunities. Yes, um, so I'm excited to talk a little bit about citizen science today. We've got a new project that we'd love your help with, um, but also just about citizen science in general because it's a great way to connect to people. Um, for educators, it's a great way to engage people in uh, research that's happening in the natural world around them. 
Um, so with that, I want to tell you a little bit about a brand new project that we've got going, um, looking for a disease of honeysuckle called honeysuckle leaf blight. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to talk briefly about you know, what citizen science is. So citizen science is typically referring to scientific research that's being conducted um, in part by non-professional scientists. So, you know, science is a process. Um, professional scientists by no means are the only ones who can do it. And citizen science uh, tends to refer to when those professional scientists and non-professional scientists are working together. Um, so it's typically a collaboration and um, I like to think of it as, you know, that that middle point between non professionals and professionals working together. Um, now there's, but there's lots of different types of citizen science and um, what that looks like can vary a lot. Um, so how non professional scientists are you know, are they leading the scientific research? Are they helping with a research project? Are they analyzing data and being involved in kind of the writing process and analysis process? It's all over the board. Um, so, you know, citizen science can kind of be what you want it to be, whether it's a bio blitz to try to learn about the natural diversity that's in your area, um, whether it's research projects uh, that are maybe being led by a scientist somewhere that really needs your help. Um, and if you're interested in that kind of thing, I posted here a couple websites, uh, Zooniverse and SciStarter, that both have you know, tons and tons of different research projects that are looking for um, the help of citizen scientists just like you. Um, or maybe we're talking about crowdfunding or crowdsourcing of science. Um, that's kind of a new thing as well as DIY science, you know, people uh, doing scientific research on their own or maybe um, drawing uh, ideas or funding for projects um, from non-professional scientists. So there's a lot of exciting things happening with citizen science and what we would like or what I'd like to talk about today is just to put one project on your radar that I'd love your help with. Um, that's a honeysuckle leaf blight survey. So that's something that um, myself here at the University of Kentucky and Rick Boyce at Northern Kentucky University are um, putting together. And uh, here in this picture you can see that this honeysuckle leaf it, it looks a little crumpled. It's got some dead patches on it. And that's a characteristic sign of something called honeysuckle leaf blight. That's a disease of honeysuckle. And um, what uh, Dr. Boyce has been finding up in northern Kentucky is that it seems to be associated with some decline of honeysuckle over time. So we're really interested in looking at, you know, could this be part of a long term management for um, honeysuckle because uh, this impacts uh, mostly uh, invasive Asian bush honeysuckle, uh, which is something most of us are probably familiar with. Unfortunately, we see way too much of it in our woods or even in our backyards, and it just takes takes over and dominates. So um, kind of just looking at what are some different approaches that we could be using to control it. And that's why we want to hear from you. Right now we don't know much about this disease. Where is it? What kind of damage is it causing? Is it on just bush honeysuckle or are we seeing it on maybe Japanese honeysuckle or other honeysuckles? So um, just a little bit of background on bush honeysuckle, if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's kind of a general name for a lot of different species of invasive honeysuckles. They're all originally from Asia and they're broadly planted as ornamentals. So there's many different species um, in our area. By and large, we have Lemister macchia or Amur honeysuckle, um, this one right here. Uh, but they are different ones um, that you might see. And yes, these are the same ones that you might have planted in your yard. Um, you know, they have those nice flowers in the spring, uh, but they will take over. Um, and some other identification features, they have leaves that are opposite each other. They have many, many red berries in the fall that birds like to eat and will spread everywhere. Um, and I think that's a, a chief reason or one of the main reasons why they disperse. Um, and then of course they're, they're flowering right now and they, they have a nice smell. Uh, they're not as strong in smell as the Japanese um, honeysuckle, which is another invasive species that grows as a vine. That one's also blooming right now. And it just, to me, you know, it smells like my childhood of, of 
finding the flowers and sipping the nectar from them. Now bush honeysuckle is not nearly as fragrant, um, but still has those really distinctive flowers. And it forms these really dense deciduous shrubs. They lose their leaves in the winter, but they are one of the first things to leaf out in the spring, one of the last things to lose its leaves in the fall. Um, and large plants might even look like small trees, but typically what I see here is this picture that I took um, earlier this spring. Before all the trees leafed out, you could see it. It was everywhere, very dense in the, the understory. Um, and there are some other lookalikes. You know, this is the native um, honeysuckle that we have. It's a vine, um, looks really beautiful and different. And here's the invasive Japanese honeysuckle that we also have in this area. But what I'm really interested in is this honeysuckle leaf blight. So here's some more symptoms of it. So if you see this, how do you let me know? Um, and let me know via the iNaturalist app. If you haven't used iNaturalist, it's a great tool because you can take pictures of things and it will basically identify them for you. It might not always be right, um, but it will generally put you in the right ballpark. And it's a free app that you can get for your phone. Um, so we've set this up as a project in iNaturalist. So if you take pictures of something that looks like honeysuckle leaf blight and just tag it as that, um, hopefully we'll find it and we'll have it added to our project. It's really easy to use. You just take a photo of something and um, it will say, you know, what is this observation? And then automatically you can get some ideas. So it's a great tool to add to your toolkit. Highly recommend it, um, but also a great way for you to connect to scientists who want your help with their research projects. Um, so I hope to see some of your observations in iNaturalist, and if nothing else, I hope that if you haven't tried it out already, you downloaded it to your phone and have some fun learning to identify um, the wonderful plants and insects uh, in your natural world around you. Well, thank you, Ellen. We really appreciate the citizen science um, aspect of this. And, you know, you, you mentioned something that I don't think we've ever heard before is something attacking bush honeysuckle. <laughs> so that might be helpful <laughs> instead of attacking our trees or something like and that. And I will say that it's really common here in central Kentucky. I see it all the time. Um, so it's not terribly rare. And, um, you know, if it were the kind of thing that was going to kill bush honeysuckle in central Kentucky, we probably would have noticed it already. Um, and it's certainly not dying. It's thriving everywhere, unfortunately, um, the invasive bush honeysuckle. At the same time, we know so little about this disease and its potential diversity and impacts um, that I think it's really worth looking into because anything that we can use to help us and help our native plant communities defend themselves against uh, invasive plants is a big win in my book. Um, so still very preliminary, very uh, beginning stage, um, but we'd love your help, uh, especially right now as we can't really travel as much. Um, where are you seeing this so we can know? Um, if people can't do the iNaturalist, um, could they always go to our fromthewoodstoday.com um, show and, and put in pictures on our survey? Sure, link? yeah, you can send me some pictures or email them to me. That's fine too. Uh, I like iNaturalist because it's easy to use, um, but definitely interested in observations, however they come in. There is a question um, from Hank that says, can we introduce the blood somehow? <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, and the blight right now, you know, I think we think it might be native to North America. So there's very little research done on it. Um, so I like that about it because time and time again, we've seen, you know, one of the big challenges with biological controls is that um, if you bring something in from outside, it might have unintended negative consequences. So that's something that I really want to look into with this is how does it impact our native honeysuckles? Um, but uh, I'd say definitely scout for it around you and see if you've got it. Um, and we really don't know, is this gonna be a helpful tool or not? Uh, it might just be a minor thing that those, those plants can deal with. Um, but that's one of the things that we'd like to learn more about in the future. Part of the discovery um, process. So Ellen, I, I can't thank you enough for all your work really on trying to help to keep Kentucky's forests healthy and, and say, um, you know, your role is so important here to the state and to all of our audience and all of the woodland owners and really all of Kentucky. And so I really appreciate all that you're doing. Well, um, thank you, Billy. And I get excited being inspired by all of our great woodland owners in the state who are doing amazing things to keep their woodlands healthy. So certainly they do. Yeah. All right.
All right. So, Renee, if we're going to keep the show going, I think we're going to bring up Mr. Darren Morris. Um, I introduced Darren a little earlier, but Darren is an extension forester in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. He's a big part of our team, but he's also the coordinator of the White Oak Initiative. So Darren's put together a, um, a video kind of introducing the White Oak Initiative, and then we'll have Darren on after for questions. And if time permits, we have a short video on hand sign that ties our work going on by the Jim Beam Institute, who is one of the members of the White Oak Initiative. So I'm going to go ahead, Renee, and pull up Darren's um, presentation. Hello. Welcome to this presentation on the White Oak Initiative. My name is Darren Morris. I am a forester for the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. I'm also the Southern Region Coordinator of the White Oak Initiative. So exactly what is the White Oak Initiative? Some of you may have heard the words White Oak Initiative and understand that it's probably about managing for white oak in our forests. The White Oak Initiative is an organized effort to ensure the sustainability of our white oak forests for decades to come. Uh, that means that we must actively manage for white oak in our forests uh, to make sure that we have white oak forests the way that we would like them healthy uh, 30 years down the road, 50 years into the future. So why White Oak? Uh, why is White Oak so important? Why does White Oak get the attention that it does? Uh, White Oak is one of the most important tree species uh, probably in the Eastern United States. Uh, White Oaks are often important landmark trees. They have meaningful historical, cultural significance. Uh, white oaks are long-lived. They can live 200 years pretty easily. Um, white oaks also happen to be one of the most widely distributed of all oaks. And I'm talking about the range of white oak. As you can see here, white oak pretty much covers uh, the, the four corners of the eastern United States. Um, don't worry so much about the details here. Just look at the dark areas, the darker green areas show the density of white oaks in our forest. And white oaks are pretty well represented uh, across numerous states in Eastern United States. White oak also happens to be one of the most important trees for wildlife. Uh, the white oak acorn is the most palatable of all the oaks. That means that it's less bitter tasting. And you might say that it tastes sweeter than other acorns. Young seedlings and saplings provide tender shoots and buds for deer uh, browsing in the forest floor. Mature white oak trees also happen to be a favorite nesting spot for birds such as the cerulean warbler. Uh, you know, white oak provides a lot of benefit for wildlife. As most oaks are important providers of forest products, white oak is certainly no exception. Uh, some of the more common low-end products are pulpwood, pallet material, railroad ties, but really the, the high demand and the high value of white oak is in the high quality saw logs uh, and the veneer. White oak is also the most highly demanded tree species by the stave and cooperage industries, uh, and that means bourbon barrels. So white oak is highly sought after. High quality white oak is in demand. Of course, everything about white oak is not ideal. When it comes to managing white oak as a component in forests, there are some hurdles to overcome. For starters, white oak happens to be one of the slower growing of the upland oaks. Considering that oaks in general are slow growing, uh, especially slower than many of the trees that they commonly have to compete against, that puts white oak at a disadvantage. It means regenerating upland oak forest after a timber harvest can prove to be difficult. In order to ensure white oak has a good chance of becoming part of the next forest stand, white oak seedlings need a head start. And that means there needs to be white oak regeneration in the forest floor ready to go. Uh, and the regeneration needs to be advanced. That means it needs to be, you know, not one foot tall, 
but you know, four to six feet tall at least in order to have a chance of uh, making it to that next stage in the forest stand. Okay, this slide tells us a lot about the regeneration problem with white oak. This data set was run by Dr. Locke here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, so look at this, age 51 to 60 years old. These are white oaks within the forests of the eastern United States, uh, this part of the region right here. And 51 to 60 year old, there are about 4 million acres of that type of forest that has 51 to 60 year old trees of which white oak is a part. So 61 to 70 year old forests with white oak, about 5 million acres, um, almost the same 70 to 80 years old, 81 to 90 years old, 90 to 100 years old. So really, it takes at least 50 years to get to the point to where a tree could become a grade one log. Uh, and even beyond that, 71 to 80 years before it can become considered as a stave log for the barrel industry, for instance. Now, looking at the number of acres of trees that are in that range, Looks like we have maybe, uh, count them up, 15, 18 million acres of that type of forest. You know, that's older than 70 years. Well, that's kind of a problem when you look at the regeneration that is going to become that forest 30 and 50 years into the future. Uh, one to 10 year old white oak forests, that's not very many. 11 to 20 years, 21 to 30 years. We have maybe three, four million acres of this regeneration that when projected, if things don't change, is going to become much less than this number of acres that we have right now, uh, showing the you know 60 to 70 year old trees, the 70 to 80 year old trees, the over 100 year old trees. Um, so that's going to create a bottleneck if we don't do things to change that right now. This slide shows that only 18% of white oak forest acreage is zero to 50 years old. So add 50 years to that. You can do the math. Uh, you know, this is not, this is what's growing towards the future. This slide kind of sums the previous two slides up. We have, uh, for instance, uh, these are 51 to 60 year old uh, stand age classes. This right here is the current regeneration that we have out in our forest today that when projected 50 years from now, that's gonna be the, the amount of forest that we have. Uh, so we're going from somewhere around 4 million uh, down to, you know, three or 400,000 acres. Same thing for the 61 to 70 year old, 71 to 80 year old. When projected, you know, that's the number that we're going to have if we don't make some changes, if we don't manage the regeneration that we have, and then also do some things to add to uh, the regeneration so that we've got more regeneration than you know, just this amount that we're growing into our future. So how are we gonna accomplish this? How will we ensure that we have the regeneration that we need uh, to grow into the future forests uh, that we demand? Uh, we wanna have healthy forests. We wanna have healthy forests that include oaks, upland oaks. Uh, we wanna grow white oak for the future. The way we do that is through the development of a partnership network to guide and support work by a range of partners. All of these entities, all these organizations uh, hold White Oak in high regard. Um, they all want to manage for White Oak. We need White Oaks for 
wildlife. We we want to maintain healthy white oak forests. Uh, and there's ways to do that. So this group has come together uh, along with others in order to ensure that that happens. So how does that involve private landowners? You know, what does that mean for you, the forest landowner? You have a forest, you wanna make sure it's healthy. That doesn't necessarily mean you wanna harvest it now. Um, but there's ways to make sure that in the future you have a healthy forest that has healthy white oak and upland oaks. So one thing we can definitely do is figure out how to grow white oak trees faster. And that's exactly what Dr. Laura DeWalt is doing with the University of Kentucky. She is heading up the white oak genetics and tree improvement program. Uh, just as an example, look in the top right corner. Both of these trees are 10 years old. The one on the left, the acorn was selected randomly out in the forest. Um, no information about the parent trees. On the right, however, this tree is a result of crossing two parent trees that we like. You know, they have the features that we would like to see in mature white oaks. Uh, so these trees were crossed and this acorn was planted. And just in 10 years, you know, the, the results are worth noting. Forest landowners can receive management assistance from professional foresters. Uh, two sources here in Kentucky. One is the Kentucky Association of Consulting Foresters. Those are certified professional foresters who can help landowners with uh, you know, anything from timber appraisals, uh, forest timber trespass, um, basic forest management, white oak regeneration work, um, and then perhaps there's cost share assistance that's also available that they could help the landowner with. The Kentucky Division of Forestry is also a good source. Um, foresters can come out and visit you and your property free of charge and provide basic management assistance uh, to help you achieve your goals. Some of the things that a forester may be looking for on your property is forest regeneration. And this is a white oak tree. It's in the forest floor and it's very small as here's my chapstick sitting beside it. So this is about a six or eight inch tall white oak tree. And even though this is white oak regeneration in your forest, this tree's undersized. It's, that's not gonna cut it. That's not gonna be able to outcompete uh, some of the faster growing trees that will be growing up right next to it um, with increased sunlight into the forest floor due to a timber harvest or a, a ice storm or whatever. This is more in line in what you're looking for when you're talking about white oak regeneration. Um, this behind me, these are, these are all white oak trees and most of these are well over six feet tall and that's what we call advanced regeneration and that's really what's required. Um, here's the white oak tree right here and whenever this thing is harvested, you need to make sure that you have all this white oak regeneration um, ready to go and ready to outcompete any other unwanted, undesirable trees. This is a forest about 10 years after a harvest and there's all kinds of regeneration here. All this stuff is good size regeneration. There's all kinds of white oaks out here in this. You can't see them from here but I happen to know they're in there. There's other species as well, but now's the time to come back in and perhaps remove these trees that were left during the last harvest. Uh, that it helped enable this regeneration to form uh, and become advanced so that it's ready to take over. Now, once these trees are removed, there could be some additional uh, management work five to 10 years down the road where we could do some potential crop tree release, where we would go in and actually select 
uh, the white oaks and the other upland oaks that we want to make sure survive to the next forest stand. So here's another picture of a forest that has advanced regeneration. Uh, we've got some pretty good sized white oak trees. All of these are white oaks. Everything you see, even the, even the ones in the background, is pretty good looking white oak forest here. Uh, and there's also a lot of regeneration, as you can see. All this stuff in here is advanced regeneration. The problem is none of it's oak. It's all something else besides oak, and it happens to be uh, hophorn beam and some hickory. There's maple. Um, there were some elms, as I recall, and dogwood trees, but there were no white oak trees. So even, even though this looks like, without delving into it further, that there's good white oak regeneration or potentially good regeneration, there's not. The species here is not right. So if we go in and we remove these trees, uh, we've basically caused ourselves a lot of management work in order to get this forest uh, back into to the conditions where it's growing healthy white oaks. Okay, this is the next size class up. I'm leaning on a white oak tree, one that I would consider a crop tree in this situation. This is, here's another one back here. There's another white oak. Uh, there's other species mixed in, black cherry, hickories. And this is a result of a clear cut, a uh, patch clear cut that had advanced regeneration in the other understory, uh, ready to go. So basically the trees that were overtopping them were harvested and here's your result. So this is what we have. It's a crop tree that we would like to make sure uh, makes it to the next forest stand because it's got good potential. It's, it's straight, it's tall, it had good uh, branch formation, and it's also a white oak tree. Along those same lines, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the same stand, just in a different location. Um, on the left is a white oak tree. That's a good crop tree. On the right was also a good white oak tree uh, that had good potential, so that's a crop tree. But in the middle here is a red maple, and that's one that commonly outcompetes upland oaks in this situation. Uh, they grow fast, and they become a problem if you're trying to manage for oaks. So in this situation, um, if we were doing a crop tree release, I would cut this and remove it in order to release the more desirable white oaks that are on each side of it. And that's kind of how crop tree release works. So once again, if you're in, interested in having a forester uh, come out, walk around your property with you, you can contact the Kentucky Association of Consulting Foresters, KACF.org, uh, or the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Uh, they'd be happy to send a forester out to help you achieve your management objectives. For more information on white oak management, uh, the White Oak Initiative, you can contact whiteoakinitiative.org. I know we will be making you know, a lot of progress in the near future, so check in and see how things are going. You can also contact me anytime, uh, darren.morris at uky.edu. Thanks. Well, thank you, Darren, for that presentation. We uh, really appreciate it and um, want to remind people, too, if they have any questions, to put those in the chat pod. And, um, Darren, one thing I was interested in, though, um, should landowners try to plant white oak? Uh, sometimes planting white oak is a good idea. Um, you may have an, a, an old field that's no longer in crop production or cattle production, uh, could be productive through planting trees. And sometimes we use tree planting uh, as an enhancement in a forest where the oak component's basically gone. You know, if it's been, uh, if it's been harvested, if something else has happened where, you know, it, it typically that type of forest would uh, have oak trees, um, you may have to go in and plant in the understory, do a little bit of sunlight management, and you can overcome that and turn that back into an, an upland oak forest uh, like it wants to be. So, yeah. 
Darren, I was going to say, I really appreciated you um, highlighting some of the assistance that's available to landowners when it comes to managing the forest. I think a lot of landowners are unaware that there is some great assistance out there, um, some of it free of charge, and that we can connect them with financial resources to help them get some work done through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So um, the other thing I'd like to you know, ask you a little bit uh, is, you know, what if the foresters come out there and make recommendations that maybe the landowners maybe don't want to do there's really no obligation that these landowners have to do the recommendations are there no there never is billy it's uh the first thing that a forester wants to know from the landowner is what are your objectives you know what what's your end result what do you want from your forest a lot of times it's just the aesthetics of owning a healthy forest and a landowner may never intend to harvest and that's fine. You know, we can grow healthy forests. We can help landowners achieve those healthy forest objectives. Um, and, you know, their goals are, are, you know, their goals. And I understand that. And, um, you know, it's fish and wildlife habitat. It's, uh, you know, watershed management. It's aesthetics, recreation, hunting. Uh, and sometimes it's the production of timber for uh, great-grandchildren, you know. Yeah. So, you know, there's yeah. ways to improve all those conditions. Yeah, that's another great point, you know, that really these management plans that foresters develop for woodland owners are really driven by the landowner, right? What the landowner wants with that property. So that's really the guiding fault um, as foresters make recommendations. So um, I, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that, you know, while there is no obligation, they are trying to develop practices that will kind of move you in the direction you want your forest to go. So um, yeah, Darren, I appreciate it. It's a really interesting, um, you know, how important the White Oak is to so many different players. And I think the White Oak Initiative is a great example highlighting how many people are interested in it, uh, its long-term survival. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more out of the White Oak Initiative as, as things progress. Yeah. And Darren, we did have a question. Um, they wanted to know what the impact of deer was on White Oak. Watching that video again, I counted. I said oak regeneration 103 times. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's because most of the management practices focus in some way on regeneration. You know, that, that next stand needs to be there uh, sort of in anticipation of the sunlight, you know, that is caused in a harvest or, or you know, whatever the situation may be. So, when you have regeneration, you have you know, happy deer. You know, deer browse is, especially in some of the high deer populated areas, can be a problem. Um, you know, there's, you can, you can engage in uh, deer hunting activities. Uh, you can just deal with it and, and make sure that you have plenty of regeneration that will hopefully eventually, you know, overcome the browsed conditions. Uh, sometimes deer will concentrate on, on trees that they have already browsed over the past few years. It creates a shrubby, uh, small tree with a lot of chewed back branches that, that uh, produce a lot of shoots. And, you know, sometimes they'll concentrate on one tree seedling and there'll be one 10, 15 feet away that they've never touched. So mm -hmm. you can overcome those situations. There are, uh, uh, you know, deer, tree shelters, you know, that you can, uh, if you're doing a tree planting, you can put trees inside those. That helps the tree get up above the four foot level, you know, where deer just, you know, they don't bother with that because it's too high to reach, maybe. Um, it's a problem. There's ways around it. Uh, and it's through forest management. Yeah. I, along those lines, Darren, I was going to say, I know in some other states, um, like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, where deer browse can be just horrific compared to what we have. I know we do have it, but I think it's a little more isolated, you know, and it occurs in kind of smaller areas, not as widespread as some of these other states have to deal with. Right. Yeah, it's definitely regional. We also have another question on when is the best time of year to transfer white oak small trees to another area? Well, after November and whenever you have the gumption to do it. You know, there's different things to consider. If you do have a high deer populated area, you might want to wait until March uh, because, you know, that thing's going to get attention. If you do, if you tree plant uh, in December or January, um, those planted trees are out there all winter. Uh, and if you have a situation where you get high deer browse, uh, they're going to get the attention all winter because there's not a whole lot else 
uh, to browse on. Um, whereas if you plan in March, things are going to be pretty soon to uh, bloom, blossom, and uh, come on along with the trees that you've planted. So there'll be other things to um, to feed on. Uh, really tree planting as far as large acreages, February, March, April are the best months. Uh, but anytime after, after November, once the tree has gone through a good dormancy, you can transplant. There's also a question about the availability of white oak tree seedlings um, from state nurseries. Um, could you speak to that a little bit, Darren? I can. Last year was a, a bad uh, acorn year for white oaks. Um, and that happens sometimes. White oak trees produce acorns, maybe a bumper crop two years out of 10. Uh, maybe some trees are better than others and produce three or four uh, good crops in 10 years. You know, there are a few differences uh, between uh, white oak trees as far as uh, characteristics and, and features. But something happened last year with the weather, with the timing of events, with, with spring uh, frost and rains that hurt the acorn crop. And they just, you know, an oak tree lives up to 500 years. They're, they don't have to produce acorns every year. Uh, Therefore, they'll just shut it off. You know, if it's worth it to not have to expend more energy producing acorns, they'll stop it for the year and try it again next year. Last year was one of those years. Um, we didn't have hardly any in Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, all the way up to Pennsylvania. Um, Missouri and Arkansas fared a little bit better. They had pretty good acorn production in, with white oaks. It looks like a lot of the nurseries around the states, Kentucky, Tennessee, and North, are somewhere around 25% of the number of seedlings uh, for next year than we had this past year. So it's good possibility we're gonna be selling out, which means uh, if you do need to buy, purchase white oak seedlings, I would get my order in as early as those nurseries start accepting orders. Usually September, some of them begin selling, uh, accepting orders anyway, after July. Yeah, the good information for sure. All right, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, Renee, I think we've got this short video on some of what's been going on with some of the members of the White Oak Initiative, Darren. Um, the Jim, James Beam Institute um, is, yes. has been doing some work. And um, I was I didn't know if you wanted to say anything before I showed that video, give a little background. Yeah, uh, hand sanitizer is in high demand now, right? And some of the distillers have stepped up, Brown Foreman, Sazerac, uh, Jim Beam, all part of the White Oak Initiative. And uh, they have started producing hand sanitizer and have been for a few months now. Um, this video is, uh, it highlights the Beam, Suntory, and the UK partnership, which is neat in their efforts to produce hand sanitizer. Uh, the video was put together back in March, so it certainly fits with today's topic. Um, and we're all part of the White Oak Initiative, so right. it's okay. a good video to see. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull that video up now. Whatever you do, don't spill it. <laughs> the University of Kentucky's James B. Beam Institute for Kentucky Spirits is doing its part to help fight the spread of the coronavirus by making sanitizer and going a step further by creating an instructional video for distillers who want to do the same. If we can get the alcohol and blend up a mixture to make hand sanitizer that makes them protected, it's just a must do it now sort of situation. Beam Suntory donated 250 gallons of high proof ethanol and Alltech, the animal nutrition company and owner of Town Branch Distillery donated glycerin. The Beam Institute team combined the ingredients in the proper ratios. The mixture yielded about 300 gallons of sanitizer. The multidisciplinary Beam Institute is naturally poised to do a project like this with experts in biotechnology, chemistry, and engineering already in place from across the university. We have a comprehensive university and we've got our amazing uh, colleagues over there in healthcare. Um, who are, who are just doing everything just, just right there in the hospital to on the front lines. And we've got this whole other collection of faculty who can get together 
and uh, support efforts like this. Bert Lynn, a chemistry professor in the UK College of Arts and Sciences, was also part of the project. This is the FDA formulation for preparing hand sanitizer. This is going to be something that, the, uh, that you can actually work into your hands very effectively and uh, really cut down on virus transmission. Lynn said maintaining social distance in the production process was a big priority for the team, constantly checking their positions, making sure they were far enough apart. So we're trying to maintain the social distancing and still get the work done. Brad Barron, professor of chemical engineering for the UK College of Engineering, led the sanitizer formulation and worked with distilleries on FDA regulations to make sure the product was the highest quality. DeBolt said he was amazed by the cooperation of so many university and industry partners to get the project done in such a timely manner. I'm really humbled by the partnership with Beam Centauri and how very focused they were on making sure this was successful and on really short notice. By doing this, we can um, produce enough hand sanitizer to have a stock that can be used in a, an emergency situation for healthcare and first responders. From the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, I'm Jeff Franklin reporting. Well, that's great. That's just another way to show how everybody's coming together to help during this pandemic. No, no doubt. Um, it's just, again, just another great example of um, how many people are working uh, related to White Oak, you know, in the state and how they've shifted gears pretty quickly to try to address some of the issues we're having. So, um, you know, Renee, we've done it again. Another great show. Uh, we talked all about White Oak today and uh, we hit it from many different angles. So I really appreciate all of our guests. They did a great job as usual. They really did. And um, make sure you join us next week. We're going to have a Forestry 101 uh, topic that's going to start coming uh, available every month. So you can get a, get a show schedule from that. Pretty soon we'll be sending all of those out to you so that you'll know. But um, we uh, have a great lineup for the next month. Um, everything from new tree, tree week to, uh, you know, more uh, things that we can do uh, in our woods. And we're hoping that um, this has kind of given you all a little bit of knowledge of things that you can get out there and do during this time. Without a doubt. And just a general reminder, you know, all of the shows are archived on fromthewoodstoday.com. There's also a survey that you can complete there if you have questions or comments you'd like to leave us, or if you want us to um, feature something else on the show in a future episode. So um, please use that to let us know. Um, we really appreciate all of you all being with us. We appreciate all the folks uh, joining us in the Zoom meeting, as well as all of those joining us on Facebook Live. Um, you know, if there's anything that we can do from the Forestry and Natural Resources Extension team, um, please don't hesitate to let us know. Forestry.extension at uky.edu, and um, we'll get back to you as quick as we can. And Renee, again, I, I really appreciate you and all your efforts in trying to keep this thing going and, and well oiled. It's, it's really a, a fun thing to be part of. It really is. And we appreciate you, the viewers. You're, we can't do it without you. So we greatly appreciate you joining us every week. And again, like I said, don't forget next Wednesday, um, 11 o'clock, same place, same time.